Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Dr. Delphine Kerop, dermatologist and uh, international medical director at Vichy Laboratoire. I'm very happy to welcome you today to our first post AAD international webinar. Together with our panel of speakers, we will share with you the latest information regarding the role of the exposome on skin and we'll share with you the posters presented during last virtual AAD three weeks ago. At the end of the presentations, you will be able to ask your questions to our speakers. You can write them in the chat board on the right of your screen and we will take them at the end. The first topic of today's meeting is about the impact of exposome factors on skin health. The exposome is the totality of exposures to which an individual is subjected from conception to death. It includes external factors, internal factors, and the human body's response to those factors. Vichy has pioneered exposome science since many years and worked with panel of experts to better understand the impact of exposome factors, either individually or combined on the skin. Indeed, since 40 years uh, of research, we have improved the knowledge of the impact of solar irradiation and especially long UVAs on skin. Uh, then uh, understand the climate, stress, nutrition, then the impact of pollution, and also hormones during menopause period. And more recently, the deleterious synergistic effect of photo pollution combined together. Our internal teams uh, have led research uh, since uh, years and uh, have published more than 30 publications on either environmental factors, lifestyle factors, or hormonal factors impact on skin. For this, we are closely working with panel of experts on these different exposome factors, whether it's UV, nutrition, hormones, sleep, pollution, to better understand their impact and develop the best solutions with or prevent or correct their effects on skin. This has led to recent publications on key topics for dermatologists and their patients, such as skin aging and exposome, acne and exposome, menopause and skin, exposome and skin barrier. And I invite you to read the supplement of GEADV wrote by our panel of experts to come very soon on the different factors impact on skin. On top of internal research and collaboration with experts, Vichy supports external research since now five years with the Exposome Grant. This year, this grant has been increased to three regional grants of 15,000 uh, euros each to be rewarded during next AAD Congress in San Francisco. The goal of this research is, of course, to have the best understanding of the biological and subsequently clinical impact of exposome factors on skin. As you saw previously, we are splitting the exposome factors in three groups. The environmental factors, such as UV pollution, climate changes. The lifestyle factors, such as nutrition, lack of sleep, stress, tobacco. And last, hormonal factors, as the variations we can observe during puberty or menopause. And we work on understanding their individual and combined effects on the different skin functions, such as skin barrier function, skin pigmentation, skin defense function, and skin structure like extracellular matrix. This exposome concept has been defined first in 2005 by uh, Dr. Christopher Wilde. It corresponds to everything which is not genetic. Today, it has been recognized that most of chronic disease are due to exposome factors and are not genetic. The first organ facing this exposome is, of course, the skin, but we are all exposed to different factors every day, which has been very nicely shown by identical twins exposed to different factors throughout their lives. And you can see the difference quite clearly on these pictures. The first skin function to be impacted by exposome factors is the skin barrier function. We know that uh, from atopic dermatitis, is from psoriasis, rosacea, where UV stress climate condition, just to sit a few of them, will impact the course of the disease, inducing either flares or sometimes improvements in the case of UV and psoriasis, for example. Let's take the example of rosacea. 
a chronic inflammatory skin condition seen in up to 10% of the general adult population. We know that rosacea patients have an altered skin barrier function and that are at higher risk of flares when they are exposed to the following factors such as UV, stress, heat, nutrition with greasy meals and alcohol. Another con skin condition is sensitive skin. It's defined as an unpleasant sensation in response to stimuli that normally should not provoke such sensation. It has a global prevalence of 38%. And the different exposure factors contributing to this condition have been very well described by Laurent Miseri since 2016. Now, skin aging, it's also a process that is not only due to genetic and age, and the role of the different exposome factors have been very well described in this review paper published by Professor Kutman. We will focus on two of them today, which are solar radiation and pollution. We all know the benefits of solar radiation in vitamin D synthesis and mood as well. We have also known well the acute effect of sun radiation, such as sunburn, photoallergies, and the chronic effects such as skin cancers, but as well skin aging, which is less known by the population, even though it's a frequent topic of consultation. It's now well recognized that if chronological aging is a normal process, photo aging will accelerate it with increased wrinkles, pigmentation spots, and drier skin. Solar radiation is very broad. Let us go into its different wavelengths. In the solar radiation, there are UV, which accounts for 5% of the solar radiation. UVC are filtered by the ozone layer. UVB uh, are very small quantity, but very intense part of the solar radiation, mainly present in middays of sunny day. And UVA, which is 100 times more numerous than UVB, especially UVA, long UVAs, which penetrate deeper in the skin and are present all year long. Then we have the visible uh, light, which accounts for 50% of the solar radiation with wavelengths from the blue uh, to red uh, wavelengths with different degrees of skin penetration. And last, infrared, which are responsible for the heat that we perceive on our skin. Let's first discuss about the UVs. They are the one involved in vitamin D synthesis, but we all know their damaging effect on the skin with induction of oxidative stress, DNA damage, and immunosuppression, which will lead to photocarcinogenesis and photoaging. More recently, long UVA1 have been recognized to also be responsible for photoaging and photocarcinogenesis, inducing at a molecular level uh, oxidative stress. At a cellular level, fibroblast cytotoxicity, Langerhans cell depression, melanocyte stimulation, and at a tissular level, altering the extracellular matrix. This is a good rationale to use broad spectrum uh, sunscreens with a strong protection against UVA. Let's talk about uh, visible light. This wavelength induces also oxidative stress and inflammatory cytokines involved in the inflammaging, such as IL-1 alpha, as well as metalloprotease. It has also recently been recognized to induce pigmentation, especially in the lighter phototypes. And a recent study has shown that wavelengths responsible for skin pigmentation was the blue one and not the red light. This is a good uh, rationale to use tinted cosmetics with a strong protection against visible light, especially in the case of patients, for example, with melasma, where the role of blue light has been well proven uh, now. Regarding infrared, we know they are responsible for erythema uh, abignae, but there are also studies showing the impact of near infrared on skin aging but still, there are controversies whether it has deleterious effects or beneficial effects. Now, uh, let's talk about all these uh, wavelengths together. So it has been proven that both infrared, visible light, and UV may contribute individually and synergistically to skin aging as they all induce 
uh, reactive oxygen species production in vivo and ex vivo. Now let's talk about pollution. A recent study conducted by Professor Kutzman's team assessed the influence of air pollution on skin aging in 400 Caucasian women aged from 70 to 80 years. Air pollution exposure was significantly correlated to extrinsic skin aging signs, in particular to pigment spots and less pronounced to wrinkles. An increase in soot and particles from traffic was associated with 20% more pigment spots on forehead and cheeks. Here are the results of another study conducted in two different cities in China. The faces of two cohorts of 102 Chinese women each of same age group, 25 to 45 years old, living in Baoding, a highly polluted city, and Dalian, a less polluted city, for at least 15 years have been analyzed. The results showed an increased severity of almost all facial signs observed in the older group, 40 to 45 years old, living in Baoding. In particular, the clinical severity of eight facial uh, signs, five related to skin structure and three related to skin pigmentation, was found strongly and significantly enhanced. More recently, we have shown that taken together, UV and pollution have a deleterious synergy, increasing by 3.5 fold the induction of reactive oxygen species, leading not only to skin aging, but also to skin carcinogenicity. Thus, to prevent skin aging, we should not only apply broad spectrum sunscreens, but also include strong antioxidants in the formulation. What is interesting is also the understanding of uh, reactive oxygen species on skin inflammation with the induction of cytokines involved in skin aging, which we call inflammaging, such as IL-1, IL-6, and TNF-alpha, which will then in turn induce the degradation of skin structure with induction of metalloprotease. As this slide summarizes, sun radiation and pollution will have an effect on skin functions and worsen skin, skin aging process. This is why the development of dermocosmetics need to take into account the understanding of the effects of exposure on skin and include derm actives that will either prevent or correct these effects. We also need to understand each individual exposome factors to be able to recommend personalized protocols. This is the ambition of the new version of Skin Concerned AI, an artificial intelligence diagnostic tool for skin aging, which um, now include scoring of uh, individual exposome factors to be able to recommend specific products and coaching on healthy tips for an holistic approach of uh, skin health. Now, we will have the presentation of three posters on exposome and skin aging, uh, which will be presented by Dr. Sot from Chile, who has taken part to an epidemiological study on exposome factors impact on skin aging. Then Dr. Escobar from Argentina, who will present new clinical data on a new anti-aging formulation. And Professor Jean Kretman, who will explain us how to show the efficacy of products against pollution side effects on an ex vivo skin model. Okay, good morning. Uh, I am Dr. Jorge Schott from Santiago de Chile. I'll be present uh, a work about uh, exposome. Okay, Chile is a land country with a diverse exposome and uh, have a very important impact on skin agent. The term exposome describes the totality of exposure to which an individual is exposed from conception on. Chile is a long country in South America with almost 4,300 kilometers length and uh, has a varied latitude and climate. The purpose of this work is the, to measure the influence of exposome on facial skin aging. This is a descriptive study with 1,910 women between 20 to 64 year old uh, from different cities uh, that have lived for at least uh, three years in different cities of the country. This study comprises two phases. The first one is a self-administered questionnaire, including social demographic characteristics, health aspects, and so on. 
and um, instrumental measures uh, were carried out by trained personnel uh, using, um, uh, for example, um, Vicia, uh, which uh, assessed wrinkles, spots, and UV spots, and uh, calculated the true skin age. Um, data was analyzed using FPS software. The main results show us that uh, the number of wrinkles in Santiago are higher if we compare with other cities like Puerto Montt. It would be probably the, uh, because of different exposures in both cities. Uh, the number of spots are higher in Antofagasta than in other cities. The UV index, uh, the higher level is in Antofagasta, which is located in the desert of Atacama, in the northern part of the country, latitude 22 degrees south. As uh, I have said, more wrinkles were observed in Santiago versus the rest of the cities. More spots were found in Antofagasta, which is expected to have, uh, because it's the um, city with the highest UV index exposed. Santiago had the highest level of stress and pollution uh, among the other studied cities. Regarding wrinkles, as uh, I have said, in Santiago, the capital, the average number of wrinkles was greater if we compare con uh, with uh, the other cities, uh, with a mean of 90. In uh, Puerto Montt, the southernmost city, the average number of wrinkles was lower. The average was 78. And uh, we have found, uh, too, that in women using sunscreen, the average number of wrinkles was higher if we compare with the ones that do not. Regarding spots, uh, as we expected, the average number of dark spots in women from 20 to 24 years old was 155 if we compare with the number of spots in women plus uh, 45 years, which is the 203. No statistical differences were, were found between different cities. And uh, it uh, was very surprising for us that women who is using a sunscreen SPF 50, the average number of spots was almost 200 versus the women that do not declare using sunscreen, 189. Regarding tobacco on spots, it was found that statistically significant differences between women that smoke versus the ones that do not. This is the first study that measuring the impact of exposome on the skin of a large women population in different latitudes of the same country. As we expected, the presence of wrinkles and pigmentation increased with age across all latitudes. In Santiago, Chile's most populated city, almost 40% of the total population, is high level of stress and environmental pollution that could influence the number of wrinkles. Unlike what happens in Puerto Montt, located at the south of the country, under lower conditions of stress and pollution. Regarding the spots, there's no difference significantly, and there is a very lack of um, concordance between the use of sunscreen, wrinkles, and spots. There is a trend that the great number of wrinkles and spots was found in women that using sunscreen. The success of this work consisted in highlighting the concept of exposome for the first time in the dermatology community of Chile. This information will be of great importance for people to understand its role in skin health and for dermatologists in evaluating, educating patients and treating skin in conditions properly. Thank you very much. Well, I am Dr. Sergio Escobar from Clinic Bass Institute, Buenos Aires, Argentina, and I want to share with you the poster we have presented in the last American Academy meeting that has been online. This poster was entitled Peptides, an effective ingredient to complement vitamin C for aging skin. It was performed by me, Carl Littner, Audrey Valois, Brigitte Claus, and Delphine Carroll. The rationale of this trials that I'm going to show you is that peptides stimulate collagen neosynthesis and vitamin C is a well-recognized antioxidant with anti-aging properties. Their formulation is critical for delivery across the stratum corneum. 
An anti-aging formula has been developed to optimize the viability of pure vitamin C, 10% concentration, combined with a biopeptide complex from rice and lupin, hyaluronic acid, and Vichy volcanic minerals in water in the same formula. The peptide C is packaged in a daily dose in an amber glass samples requiring no preservatives. The objective of this clinical study was to evaluate by clinical assessment and subjective evaluation the effectiveness on wrinkles and radiance of the, of the skin of this topical preparation. The first trial I'm going to show you is the Dancil chloride testing. Dancil chloride is a typical test to show the cells turnover in the skin. As, as you can see here as a conclusion, after 22 days in the area treated with peptide C, the skin uh, renewal is faster and the fluorescence is lower comparative with the non-treated area. The second trial I'm gonna show you is the clinical cosmetical trial. And you can see that after four weeks of treatment, the wrinkles in the crow's feet, in the forehead, and in the nasolabial form are significantly uh, decreased with the treatment. When you ask the patients, almost 80% of them feel the skin more radiant, almost 77 smoother, and 64% indicate that the wrinkles are less visible. The third study we have presented in this poster is an instrumental study where we have taken a sample of the crow's feet area and then made an evaluation to instrumental scoring with a quantification software and a 3D fringe uh, uh, system. So there you can see that after almost one month of treatment, not only the number of wrinkles are significantly lower, less than 11%, but also the surface of the wrinkles in total are reduced and the total length of them are strongly reduced as well. So as a conclusion of these three trials, we can say that the formula of peptide C topical serum containing the biocomplex and the vitamin C in an innovative packaging was consistently shown to be effective in improving facial wrinkles and skin renewal. But before finishing, let me show you some in vitro data which support these results. On one hand, the strong antioxidant effect of the combination of the biopeptides with vitamin C, reducing the free radical pro pro production compared with negative uh, control and also with vitamin E as a positive control. The cellular antioxidant protection also has been uh, achieved and the increased cell viability under the exposure of hydrogen peroxide or um, UVA or also pollution as a result of the main exposome factors and the increased viability when you add the compound to the, to the, to the cells. As a biochemical uh, point of view, the inhibition of lipid peroxidation, inhibition also in the protein glycation, and most important, the inhibition in the metalloproteinase activity produced by the compound. Finally, the augmentation in the production of collagen in the Q culture system, com combining uh, keratinocyte with fibroblasts, and also in the reconstructed human epidermis uh, model where the supernatant, when you add the product, you put it in the, in the fibroblast culture and the results is a strong increase, especially in collagen type 7, which can be shown by immunofluorescence. So, uh, as a summary, the in vitro trials uh, about reduction in oxidative stress, increasing in cellular viability, and increasing in collagen synthesis are combined with a clinical efficacy which has been shown by this product in the reduction of wrinkles and in increase in the radiance of the skin. Thank you.
So hello everybody, I'm Professor Krupman from the IOF in uh, Dusseldorf and today I would like to share with you some very recent results from a study in which we assessed the capacity of a cosmetic product, Lifactive Cure, to prevent air pollution induced skin damage, in particular skin hyperpigmentation. Um, the background of this study is, is that it is now very well established that exposure to traffic related air pollutants is associated with facial pigment spots and uh, skin wrinkles and that we have recently developed a standardized robust ex vivo human skin model to look further into the underlying mechanisms and we have found that when you topically treat human skin with a standard a mixture of diesel exhaust particles at environmentally relevant non-toxic concentrations, then uh, we can observe an increase in skin pigmentation and also uh, gene stress response. And we wanted to know whether these events can be mitigated if we pretreat the skin models with uh, lift active cure. So uh, the the test product contained uh, vitamin C, vitamin E, neohesperidine, and uh, maritime pine polyphenols as potent antioxidants. As I said, this is an ex vivo skin culture model, uh, which was treated topically with a standardized diesel exhaust particle mixture. And we analyzed skin color and we looked at gene expression. If you first please focus on the lower right part of the slide, and you can see that we have here untreated skin models. Then the models were treated once, twice, or three times uh, with the diesel exhaust particles. And you will appreciate uh, that this causes a time and dose dependent increase in skin pigmentation. And if the models have been pre-treated with live active cure, you can nicely see that this is greatly decreasing the skin pigmentation response uh, in these models. And this is uh, less the case if they have been pretreated with the vehicle only. And this can be quantified, of course, by chromometry. This you can see here. So there is a decrease in delta eta values, indicating an increase in skin pigmentation in the untreated, uh, only diesel stress models. Uh, this is not affected by the vehicle, but this is almost completely reduced by the lift, up, lift Active Cure product, and this is the, the difference is even greater when we treat twice with the diesel or when we treat three, three times with the diesel. Um, when we look at the gene expression level, we found that there is a lot of pro-inflammatory, uh, that there is a lot of genes important for skin pigmentation that is also increased above background levels by the diesel exhaust particle. And the same holds true for many of the genes which are important for the skin inflammation or inflammaging, for example, interleukin-1 alpha, interleukin-8, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and so on. And when we then see what the lift active cure is doing to this increase in gene expression, then you can see that, for example, for R1 alpha, there is a significant inhibition of this diesel-induced upregulation also for tumor necrosis factor alpha for interleukin-10. And this is not the case uh, for the, the vehicle treated cells. So, so to summarize all this, a formulation containing vitamin C, vitamin E, neohesperidine, and maritime pine polyphenols as active ingredients significantly reduce diesel exhaust particle induced skin pigmentation and gene expression of pro-inflammatory cytokines which are involved in inflammation. And these studies emphasize that a formulation containing an appropriate cocktail of antioxidants is effective in protecting human skin against air pollution induced skin pigmentation and thus skin aging. Thank you. Now let's see the posters presented on the efficacy of Vichy volcanic mineralizing water on skin barrier recovery presented by Dr. Berardesca from Italy and USA, as well as Mineral 89, which contains 89% uh, of Vichy volcanic mineralizing water and hyaluronic acid on improving skin barrier in different skin conditions and how it can be combined to prescription treatments. Good afternoon. My name is Enzo Berardesca. I am an Italian dermatologist working at the University of Miami in Florida, USA. Today, I'm going to present a study showing the effects of Vichy mineral water on skin barrier function properties. 
As you know, the protection of skin barrier and the restoring of barrier in condition where it's damaged by skin disease or environmental condition is of pivotal importance in keeping our skin healthy. The uh, Vichy mineralizing water is a very popular uh, thermal water in France. Uh, it originates from the Auvergne region and it's uh, recognized to be very rich in minerals that improve barrier function and skin natural defenses. It has been renowned since the 18th century for its soothing dermatological properties and it's used as a cosmetic ingredient since 1930. Uh, the uh, objective of the study today was to evaluate the effects of the she volcanic mineralizing water versus another thermal water from another uh, French region on uh, the capability of restoring uh, skin barrier function after chemical irritation induced by sodium lauryl sulfate application according to the guidelines published in Conta Dermatitis a few years ago. Uh, 20 women entered the study, uh, age range between 20 and 60 years old, and the study, the test have been done on the whole forearm, where no moisturizing products or other cosmetics have been allowed for the previous 10 days. Three different sites were identified on the forearm, uh, each site of nine square centimeter, where irritation was induced by applying 3% uh, sodium uh, release, release sulfate uh, in occlusion for 16 hours. After removal of the patches, uh, three sites were treated respectively with the Vichy mineral, uh, mineralizing water uh, twice a day for 10 days, the other uh, thermal water twice a day for 10 days, and one site was left untreated. Um, the investigation of uh, barrier function has been done by uh, instrumental, uh, by transectermal water loss using a TEVA meter, measuring redness by the coma meter, and uh, by visual scoring, evaluating uh, erythema uh, by a dermatologist on a four point scale from absent to severe. The results are shown here in this slide, in this graph. Transepidermal water loss, as you can see here in the blue line, is already statistically significant, reducing the site treated with Vichy mineralizing water at day two. And uh, there was uh, no significant, uh, statistically significant decrease of this value for the normal, uh, for the other thermal water and for the untreated skin until day six, as you can see here. Regarding uh, redness measured by the chromometer, there was a 20% decrease at day six after uh, application of uh, UVC mineral water. There was an improvement with the other thermal water, but with no statistical significant relevance, and uh, which appeared for the, the untreated site and the other water only at day eight. Regarding erythema, visually assessed by the dermatologist, there was a recovery of erythema at the day two. Uh, you can see here always in the blue line versus day zero. And the crazy erythema was uh, not statistically significant compared to baseline uh, for uh, the uh, other thermal water only at day three and for the other uh, no treatment only at day six. So in conclusion, we can say that the she volcanic mineralizing water leads to a faster recovery of transepidermal water loss and erythema following uh, SLS exposure and barrier disruption compared to another thermal water or to untreated skin. So the study supports the view that the regular treatment with Vichy mineral water can help in keeping the barrier healthy and stronger towards chemical aggression and more protected in case of skin disease. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Jerry Tan from Western University in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, and it's a pleasure for me to be here to present on behalf of Vichy. The talk today is on Mineral 89, which is a combination of 89% Vichy mineral spring water, and along with hyaluronic acid in efficacy and tolerability with regard to various facial inflammatory dermatoses and as an adjunct in post-procedural care in dermatology. Just as background, the skin exposome comprises a number of external and internal factors that can affect the skin barrier. 
And these include factors such as UV radiation, pollution, as well as internal factors, for example, including inflammatory cytokines and uh, inflammatory insults uh, internally. So they can then lead to problems with skin diseases or acceleration of skin aging. Mineral 89 was developed by Vichy as a minimalist formulation containing 89% Vichy mineral water along with hyaluronic acid to address um, skin barrier protection against some of these exposomal factors. The question in this study was to evaluate the role of Vichy Mineral 89 as an adjunctive therapy in patients with inflammatory facial dermatoses and especially those who have rosacea, sensitive reactive skin, as well as those undergoing dermatology procedures. So overall, 1,630 patients were recruited and we'll go through the distribution of those patients in a moment. M89 was applied twice daily as an adjuvant to their standard care, whether it was for inflammatory dermatoses or for post-procedure, it was a, um, recommended as adjunctive to their standard treatment. Clinical evaluations at baseline and after four weeks included clinical assessments of erythema, desquamation, and irritation. And patients were asked to evaluate dryness, burning sensation, itching, and stinging. So these are the tolerability aspects they were asked to provide uh, responses to. After four weeks, the overall physician global rated assessment for uh, satisfaction was asked, as well as subject rated satisfaction. Regarding procedures and indications, this comprised two-thirds of the uh, study group, approximately 67 percent, and the procedures were primarily the following, facial peels, lasers, and IPL, high, in, high intensity focus ultrasound, as well as radiofrequency treatments, and a number of other treatments that will be well recognized by dermatologists as those that we perform regularly. The most common reasons that they were performed was really for facial aging, a smaller amount for acne and a smaller amount yet for specific lesions. The dermatologic indications comprise one third of the entire recruited population. And here you can see the majority of patients had either sensitive skin, reactive skin, or rosacea. A smaller proportion had dryness only, redness problems only, a combination of other factors, um, or a combination of the three that we had initially discussed. Demographics, the overall population was largely female. You can see that it's 92% female, which is um, reflected also in the rosacea sensitive skin population, um, as well as in age, which was approximately 40 years old in both groups. The dermatologic evaluation of clinical signs, the evolution of erythema, I'll just explain this type of graph to you first. The lilac uh, indicates the dermatoses, while the teal represents the post-procedural care. And the color bars represent uh, very intense, for example, here it's very intense erythema, and green represents none. Okay? So this begins at baseline and end of study. And all of these next figures will be represented in a very similar way. So what we see with evolution of erythema, for example, with the dermatoses, is a shift to the right where there is progressively less and less intensity, uh, very intense, moderate uh, erythema to much greater proportions with either very little or no erythema. So that overall, for those who had erythema at baseline, there was 67% uh, improvement. And correspondingly, you see that shift to the right and 72% uh, improvement in those who had post-procedure care. So after that explanation, all of these boxes will seem very similar to you because of the shift to the right uh, with increasing amounts of proportions of patients with none of these um, factors 
here it's irritation, and the proportion of improvement, which was um, approximately 90 plus percent for irritation. We see the same types of shifts to the right with desquamation, as well as with skin hydration. Patients were asked to evaluate their symptoms. Here we see evolution of dryness from uh, over time and the um, scale was zero to 10, where 10 was extremely and zero was none. And again, the lilac bars indicate dermatoses, the light blue represents the post-procedural. And here we see from baseline to end of study, there was a reduction in overall mean score, in this case of erythema, I'm sorry, in this case of dryness, where there was an overall decrease of uh, 64%, and similarly so in post-procedure. And with um, burning sensation, the evolution was all to the improved side, as well as for itching sensation and for stinging and tingling sensations. We looked at the rosacea sensitive skin, uh, reactive skin group very specifically because this was a group of uh, dermatoses that we knew would have uh, perhaps more uh, issues in terms of the erythema as well as the tolerability. And what we see here, however, is that even with this group, we still see a nice evolution of a shift to the right in terms of the clinical assessment of reducing erythema with overall 59% uh, reduction of erythema in those who had it at baseline. While the subject signs evaluated by the patient showed a reduction here of burning sensation in this figure of stinging, tingling sensation, and then of dryness. Global satisfaction, this was evaluated at week four in the overall population in dermatoses we see that um, the overall mean score was 8.8 .8 out of 10. So very high levels of satisfaction, very similar high levels of satisfaction in the post-procedural group. For the rosacea sensitive reactive skin subgroup, we see very similar numbers that were already very high at the end of um, the first week. And by end of fourth week, it had uh, progressively increased. So overall tolerance, global population found it was very well tolerated. This is very good or good uh, tolerability as well as that in the patients who had um, uh, patients who were post-procedural as well. In the rosacea sensitive skin, reactive skin subgroup, we also saw a very high level of tolerability um, considered to be very good and good at uh, almost 100%. So in summary, mineral 89, which is this combination of Vichy volcanic water and hyaluronic acid, um, was shown to be efficacious with high levels of tolerability and satisfaction as an adjunct to standard management in patients who had various dermatoses, including that subgroup with rosacea sensitive and reactive skin, as well as in post-dermophlogic procedures. My next presentation is also looking at Vichy Mineral 89, but here the question was whether it modifies the cutaneous penetration of topical ivermectin in ex vivo skin modeling. We know that rosacea is a chronic inflammatory dermatosis, and it is typically one that presents with a number of diagnostic features such as persistent erythema, thyma, and a number of major features such as inflammatory papules and pustules, transient erythema, telangiectasis, and ocular features. The use of a product, ivermectin 1% cream, has been found to be especially efficacious in the treatment of the papulopustular features of rosacea. And we have previously discussed the role and the efficacy and tolerability 
of the mineral 89 used as an adjunctive treatment in patients with rosacea in the overall um, global study. Here, the question was whether mineral 89 may modify the absorption of ivermectin 1% cream when used either before or after uh, M89 application. The methodology used a Fran cell diff diffusion chamber technique, which is a standard technique used to evaluate for skin uh, penetration of various topical medications. On one side is the application of the product. The intervening um, membrane in this case was um, skin, and these were derived from human skin samples from three donors, two women and one man, um, all who underwent abdominal plastic surgery. And these samples were then put into the Franz chamber with epidermal uh, and dermal aspects. On the other side of the Franz chamber is receptor fluid from which the receptor fluid um, target product will be sampled, in this case, ivermectin. The three test conditions were application of ivermectin 1% cream alone. So in fact, that is the index uh, evaluator to understand whether the other two possible um, aspects, two other arms of the studies would modify the amount that's, um, that penetrates through the skin and into the skin. And that is application of ivermectin after application of uh, M89 or application of M89 before application of uh, ivermectin. So the time between application of these products was 20 minutes and the overall uh, volume of receptor fluid was seven mils and it was collected after 24 hours to evaluate for the amount of tissue on the receptor side. So that would be the post dermis side. What was found was that um, ivermectin was not detected in the receptor fluid and it's demonstrated for you in this panel. Um, and it was mostly found in the stratum corneum. The stratum corneum is shown in the first panel and was um, ivermectin by itself in the pink. Um, this was M89, 20 minutes later, ivermectin was applied and you can see that there is no significant change given the means and the standard deviations. And the blue panel represented ivermectin and then 20 minutes later, the application of M89. So a lot of that product was actually found in the stratum corneum and a lesser amount was in the epidermal dermal aspect. And as I was saying, none in the receptor fluid. And these total amounts were not different between groups. This demonstrates that M89 does not affect or modify the cutaneous absorption of topical ivermectin, which is a very commonly used medication for treatment of the papules and pustules of rosacea. Thank you very much. So thank you very much um, to uh, our panel of speakers uh, for uh, these uh, presentations uh, of these posters presented at last uh, AAD. So now we have uh, collected uh, some uh, some questions in uh, in the chat. So some of them have been uh, addressed, uh, especially um, one is uh, what is the effect of exposome on skin. I think we have covered the skin barrier effect, skin aging. Of course, the exposome will have also impact on uh, acne, uh, on uh, skin in uh, uh, menopause period. Um, let's start with another question on the exposome, I think, for Dr. Sot. Uh, when researching the relationship between pigment and UV light, why did you choose the spots data, but not the UV spots data? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, we have choose both. Spots and uh, UV spots are um, the fact in this uh, presentation. And uh, we have found that the number of spots, 196, uh, is higher 
in Antofagasta, which is the desert of Atacama, the northern city in this study, 22 degrees um, south. Um, the spots are higher, probably because, uh, of course, they are the, the women are exposed to high radiation. The UV index is 14 if we compare with the 11 in the other parts uh, of the country. And um, uh, also because the time of uh, exposure are very large. So we don't have, we don't have a, a just the UV radiation, but uh, the, the time of exposure too. And uh, otherwise we have found that the UV spots are lower if we compare with the um, other uh, part of the city, which is very surprising because uh, the radiation is high and the UV spots are low. Um, we can hypothesize that uh, these women know probably that uh, they are high risk of uh, UV damage and they use sunscreen proper, properly in a proper use. We can, we can say that, but the results are not significant uh, at all. Okay, thank you very much. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sot. Um, I have a question for uh, Jerry Tan. Um, mineral 89 uh, should be used for which type of skin? So the question about the use of mineral 89 for actual skin types is um, the, the nice part about it, I think based on what we've seen is you can use it as adjunctive therapy for patients who have a tendency to sensitive skin or undergoing skin repair procedures. But I think it can actually be helpful for a wide range of skin types because it is such a nice gentle formulation and I think the real test of a formulation is whether people like the way it feels. So if you provide this to patients or clients and uh, if, if they're aesthetic patients, you'll notice a lot of them are very positive about it because it feels so nice. Plus, if it can help reduce exposomal effects on the skin and it has uh, repair effects on the skin barrier as we've seen by a previous uh, speaker, then those are all very positive things in addition to sun protection. So I think it can serve a wide range of skin types. Uh, I have two more questions uh, for you, um, Dr. Tan. Um, what other standard treatment did the subject use uh, with uh, Mineral 89 in the observational study? In the observational study, because Mineral 89 was used as adjunctive to standard therapy determined by their dermatologist, it is whatever the standard of care is in the practice of that dermatologist. So it could have been any of the topical or oral therapies, for example, with rosacea. It could be some of the wound care and wound healing therapies post-procedure from either facials or peels or lasers. So it would just depend on what their standard of care was. And because there was a lot of variability, both in procedures and in number of practitioners, um, all we can, all, the only term we used that was uh, specifically to address that was their standard of care. Okay. Uh, a last question about um, Mineral 89, uh, Dr. Tan, uh, the interaction study. Are there three people in each group, two women and one man? That's right. The, the, the ex vivo samples were obtained from um, those patients uh, undergoing aesthetic abdominal plasty. So from that extra skin, there were samples obtained that were just skin samples, that is epidermis and dermis. Okay. Uh, I have uh, one question for you, uh, Dr. Berardesca, about your study on uh, Vichy uh, mineralized water on skin barrier recovery. Uh, what is uh, the observation interval based on? Is there any consideration in choosing the day three instead of day four? Very specific question. <laughs> well, yes, in, in this kind of uh, experimental irritation uh, using SLS, uh, there are some guidelines which are standardized and since it's since this is a, a slight irritation because we don't want to arm the subjects, most of the changes for this kind of slight irritation occurs within 72 hours after removal of the patch. And this is why we have measured closely day two and day three and then every other day in the long term. Thank you very much. 
Professor Krutman, I have one question also for you regarding your study, uh, ex vivo uh, skin model of uh, pollution effect. So why was the gene expression test chosen on day seven rather than the three, six, nine day setting of the previous test? Yeah. So that's a very specific question. Very specific, and it shows me that uh, apparently the, the one who asked the question had a close look at the slides, which is very nice, of course. Um, it's very easy to explain. Let me just tell you how we do the, uh, the assay. So for the first 24 hours, the uh, ex vivo skin models just sit in culture. And then we topically treat them with the diesel exhaust particles. And we wait for three days. Then we, we do our measurements or we harvest for the uh, mRNA expression. Then we, we add again the diesel exhaust particles, wait again for three hours. Then the same happens again. Then add again diesel, then wait for another three hours. So now depending on whether you count in the first 24 hours, uh, it's either three or four days, six or seven days, nine or 10 days. And I'm sorry, we just uh, did not um, uh, make sure that the, the counting was always the same. So in other words, it's the same time point when the mRNA is being analyzed as all the other parameters. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we have another question related to the blue visible light from uh, our device. Can this type of light affect our skin? Uh, so as of today, there is no um, data showing that using a, a device uh, would induce uh, a pigmented uh, skin or you know, a pigmentation because the uh, intensity of uh, the blue light coming from the device is very low. However, there is one uh, interesting study showing that uh, um, after a, a skin irritation model with blistering, uh, you can induce uh, post-inflammatory uh, hyperpigmentation when the skin is exposed to ambient light. So as of today, uh, post-inflammatory uh, um, hyperpigmentation is increased uh, with maybe increased with the ambient light, but the devices do not increase uh, pigment, skin pigmentation. Um, okay, so um, I think we had many questions, but uh, uh, I think uh, most of them has been uh, addressed. In which uh, dermocosmetic treatment do you consider more interesting the use of mineral 89? And for how long? So maybe uh, Jerry, can you uh, answer this uh, new question? In which uh, dermocosmetic treatment do you consider more interesting the use of mineral 89 and for how long? I think the value to mineral 89 after derm um, dermal cosmetic procedures or dermal cosmetic procedures or aesthetic procedures is primarily in uh, areas where there has been some barrier injury. So for example, we induce barrier injury to enhance repair and we then hope that there's increased collagen formation and glycosaminoglycan deposition. So typically that would be with uh, facial peels, that would be with uh, superficial laser therapy and uh, sometimes with also with microneedling. Those would be the ones that are clearly impacting the epidermis. And uh, I think, you know, for patients who have those types of procedures, it would be a very nice adjunct to add on. Thank you very much. Maybe a last question. What about LED lights uh, that are used now? Do they, do they affect the skin? Uh, one of the studies that I showed, uh, um, you know, uh, compared the effect of uh, red light and blue light on the skin pigmentation and it's uh, definitely the blue light with a dose clear dose effect that will induce uh, skin pigmentation rather than the red uh, light. Um, okay so i think uh, we need to conclude because we are close to the end so uh, thank you very much uh, uh, to uh, all uh, our speakers i have just a few slides for the, the conclusion so how can we act 
uh, to protect the skin from the exposome. Of course, uh, we know that uh, the exposome is something that is uh, uh, really evolving uh, with uh, time. It depends uh, on the changing uh, of uh, climate, uh, on the lifestyle, uh, the pollution. We have seen also with uh, this uh, uh, recent uh, COVID-19 epidemic that our life has changed. So um, the skin will adapt to its environment and we need, of course, to understand um, the effect of this exposome to the skin and educate uh, our patient to protect themselves. Uh, now, uh, the dermocosmetics may have a, a role in the prevention and protection of the skin against the UV pollution to restore also the skin barrier. They also have a role for correction of uh, skin conditions, either uh, alone or uh, combined with procedures or medications to prepare the skin, increase the benefits of uh, the procedures or medications, or reduce the side effects uh, of this uh, treatment. It can also be used as a maintenance to prolong the effects of procedures or medication. I want to invite you uh, to submit your uh, ideas to this uh, uh, new edition of uh, Exposome Grant uh, supported by Vichy since uh, five years. And now this year we have increased uh, the grant to three regional grants of 15 uh, K euros each. And uh, you have all the details uh, on our website and you can uh, apply for uh, this uh, Vichy grant on this uh, website. The deadline is uh, February 1st. With that, I would like uh, really to uh, thank the speaker again, uh, thank uh, the audience. Uh, um, if you want to see again uh, this webinar, it will be available on demand on uh, the European Medical Journal, uh, Canal Chat, and also Skin Alliance. Uh, and uh, this uh, webinar was supported by uh, Vichy uh, Laboratoire. So uh, I wish you a very nice day. Thanks again uh, to uh, all our speakers. Uh, uh, it was great to have you uh, today and um, see you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.